Well, today's sermon is Devil's Defeat, Undivided Love. And uh, before we get to our main scripture, and we're going to return to this scripture, there's just so much there, we're going to return to this scripture and extend it a little bit next time from Luke eleven fourteen and following. Today we'll just read through 23. I wanted to pull back and reflect on both, you know, you may ask, why that sermon, Pastor Martin or Pastor Lifer? And you also may be helped, and we all may be helped by the big picture approach before we get to this key scripture where Jesus makes a remarkable and profound statement. So let me pull back and just ask you this question. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus come to earth? Can you answer that question? As a Christian, as a, certainly as a Christian parent who's charged to um, educate your children in the household, we don't just do it here in the church, we do it in our homes. Can you answer that question? Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? There's all kinds of answers that could be given, but the scripture puts it in terms of why would Jesus, the Son of God, come in the flesh born of woman, as Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. What's going on with that kind of language that Paul is, as he reflects at one of the earliest creeds of the early first century Christian church, that in the fullness of time, God sent his son born of woman why is that such a big deal in that earliest or among the earliest of the christian creeds from the first century church what is going on there why did jesus come now liberal theologians for the last two and a half centuries have said well he came to be a good moral teacher to help improve us because Education is our way to salvation, and if we can become more educated and generally nicer people, then the world can be saved unto itself. But that's not the right answer. Jesus did come so we could be nicer, I guess, in a way, but, um, and Jesus was certainly the greatest of moral teachers, but it's not just that. So why did Jesus come? Well, some of us, certainly, who at least had a children's Sunday school education would say, um, to save me, to save me. Now, now, that is true, but that's a very limited understanding uh, of why Jesus came. It had to do a lot more than that. Why did Jesus come? Well, to die on the cross for my sins and our sins. Yes, he did that, but that's still not the whole story. So why did Jesus come? Well, toward the close of the New Testament, the Apostle John gives us the central summary that then presents a bridge from Jesus' gospel work into the final capstone book of the New Testament that some of you are studying with me on Thursday morning, the book of Revelation. And here is the one verse summary, and it's this, that God sent his son for this purpose. You see that? First John. God sent his son for this purpose. The son of God appeared to do what? Destroy the works of the devil. So in other words, to save you, dying on the cross to save people from their sins, and by the way, if you have a bigger picture understanding in the New Testament, you would say to regenerate the creation and bring a new heaven and a new earth. Yes, to do all that, he came to centerpiece, destroy the works of the devil. Again, if you are studying Revelation with me right now, you know that we just hit the centerpiece section of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 through 15, verse 4, where we get a series of seven signs, count them seven signs, all talking about unveiling very fully what Revelation has been talking about earlier, that this is ultimately a, a battle between God's people through Jesus and Satan and his people. Well, this is all laid out for us all the way back at the very beginning of the Bible. 
in something that theologians from the earliest days of the church have called the proto-evangelium, the proto-evangelium. If you're a little bit rusty, I know most of you are not, but if you're a little bit rusty on your Latin and your theological Latin, let me just tell you, that means first form gospel. Proto-evangelium means the first form of the gospel that we get in the Bible. And if I had made you guess, you might have said, well, is it in early Matthew or something like this? And I would say, no, the first form of the Bible appears, the first form of the gospel in the Bible appears at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And let me just set the context for you. It's after the fall, and when God is judging sin, you got to get this, okay? God is judging sin, and as part of that, he is cursing the serpent who has deceived and provoked the woman and ultimately the man through the woman to sin, okay? So, in other words, we're going to get a message of salvation in the context of judgment, and I'll go ahead and tell you this too, suffering, including the suffering of the hero of this prophetic statement by God, okay? So you got to get this. The whole message of the Bible is going to be judgment through suffering and salvation through judgment and suffering. Okay? All right, so here's, here's the proto-evangelium. The Lord, speaking judgment upon and cursing the serpent, says this. I will put enmity or outright hostility. You could translate that between you, in other words, the serpent, and the woman, between your seed, Zerakah, and her seed, Zerah. Now, that's a masculine singular in the Hebrew. Almost all the English translations are going to translate it for you, descendants, okay? But it's not actually in the Hebrew plural, okay? It's singular, which Paul highlights in his interpretation of the Old Testament into the New Testament in his letters, okay? Because the central purpose and the central calling is going to be for one particular seed of the woman. And if you'll go back and remember, you can go back and listen to the sermons when I was talking about the virgin conception of Jesus, You'll remember I talked about how this is prophetic of the virgin conception. Because everywhere else in the Bible, when you're talking about seed, you're talking about seed of males. But here, all of a sudden, you're talking about a seed of a woman. It's a total disjunction with the rest of the Bible. Well, you're anticipating that no man is going to sire whoever this ultimate key seed is. It's going to come through woman by the grace of God. Okay, So that's going on there. But notice what the conflict is between you and the woman, between your seed, in other words, the children of the serpent, and her seed. Read that both singular, ultimately looking to Jesus, and then everybody who comes alongside Jesus, plural. So it's okay to translate it plural once you understand centrally it's singular. He, again, that's masculine and singular, he, whoever this seed of the woman is, And you know this is Jesus, right? He shall crush your head. That means he's going to take out your dynasty. He's going to take out your house. He's going to take out your kingdom. Head represents rule and kingdom. He shall crush your head. You shall crush his heel. In other words, he's going to have to suffer. And that's a deadly, potentially deadly strike from a poisonous snake. So salvation through judgment and suffering. And Paul, again, highlights this in Galatians 4.4 4, when he starts summing up and the early Christian creed sums up what's going on with Jesus coming. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Yes, he sent because he loved the world. But what was going on with that? What's the game plan? He sent his son born of woman. You see how that goes right back to Genesis 3.15, Galatians 4.4. 4. Now, You know I love the way the old Scott Presbyterian pastors in previous centuries and old Scott Presbyterian theologians talked about the work of Christ. 
the son's mission as dealing with the fruit, the root, and the brute. Y'all know this, right? If you're a Presbyterian, you've probably heard this before. You've heard me talk about it before, right? Jesus came to deal with the fruit, the root, and yes, that's what we're talking about today, the brute. Jesus establishes his kingdom. Yes, he regenerates and justifies all creation. And he regenerates people who are called to himself. In other words, gives us new life, and he's going to give new life to the whole creation. A new heaven and a new earth. He's going to justify things, make right everything according to God's order by dealing with the fruit and the root of our sin and the brute who rules us through sin and our fear of death. Jesus comes to deal with all that. Not, so don't just stop with, well, he deals, he's dealing with the fruit of my sin. You know, he dealt with some bad things I did yesterday and earlier in my life. Yeah, he's dealing with that. He's going to go to the root of your sin. But even more than that, he's going to deal with the brute who keeps us enslaved under sin and death. He's going to take out Satan. And he's going to take out Satan's kingdom. But how? Will Jesus use sheer brute force on the brute? Is that the way Jesus comes? With guns blazing, like the gunfighter at the OK Corral. You know, is that the way Jesus shows up? No. The Son is actually sent by the Father's undivided love. Love. Are you got to be kidding me? Love is going to conquer Satan? Yeah. But that's the good news game plan. The Son comes in the Father's undivided. Do you hear me? It's clear and total. Undivided love. God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life eternal. Well, what about the son himself? Is he in? Is, is the Trinity divided on this game plan? No. The Trinity is undivided and has undivided love. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul tells us that Christ's undivided love frees us from all condemnation. And who's the main person who brings the case against us? The accuser, Satan, okay? We're freed from all condemnation, including especially that of Satan and his demons. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, the Apostle Paul speaks of Satan's final defeat by the undivided love of God. Christian, you need to understand this and rejoice in this. This is huge. <laughs> this is the game changer. The love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit securing us in Christ's undivided love for us. He's not, you, you see what I'm saying? Jesus is not going to change his mind about you. And, and so Paul puts it this way. In the courtroom of God, who will divide us? It's usually translated separate, but I'm highlighting the divide right now today. Chorase is, is, the, is the Greek here, okay? Who will divide us from the love of Christ? This is the key question that Paul is asking rhetorically at Romans 8.35, and he's going to end up saying nothing is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord because Jesus and God the Father are undivided and their love is undivided and everybody who belongs to Jesus is never to be divided from God and it doesn't matter what kind of case Satan wants to bring against you. That's what Paul is saying in Romans 8. So no angel, no ruler, no authority is going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's the way Paul closes out what we read as Romans chapter 8. This all circles around to why Jesus came. So I hope you can fill in the blanks now. Number one, it was devil's defeat, right? And the second part of the sermon and the template for the entire Bible, really, is undivided love. Now, understanding that, let's take a look at our scripture, and I'll just do what I can do with this scripture today. We'll come back to it next time, too. Hear now God's word from Luke 11, beginning at verse 14. We'll read through verse 23 today. Now, he, this means Jesus, was casting out a demon that was mute. I can just tell you, it's hard to translate that, and the question is, is the demon mute, or is the man mute from the demon possessing him? And the, the second part is definitely true. 
it appears that the demon may be mute too because Satan like harms things and then wants other things to reflect the harm, the degradation, okay? So now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, this is a huge verse here, one of the most important in the Bible. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Not just come near, it's here. It's here. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides the spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Now, we have been learning and spending late spring into the first half of the summer learning about Jesus' teaching on prayer. And as a centerpiece for that, we've learned about the Lord's Prayer. And each little phrase, each little clause of the Lord's Prayer, we have looked at and sought to unpack and then apply into our prayer lives and our faith lives. Now let me just remind you, the key opening of the prayer is Father. Jesus teaches us to come, on, come alongside Jesus and be children of God and trust in God and obey God as Father, be part of his household. This is a family prayer for a household of children who are secure in the Father's undivided love. That's the gospel invitation to you and me. And that's what we're invited to pray in every day, that we trust and are secure in the Father's undivided love. That's the way we come to him in prayer. Now, later on in the prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come. But that begs the question, Okay, the kingdom's not here yet, and what are we dealing with? What's the kingdom going to be in opposition to? We're not just talking about a vacuum. I guess we could be, but it's clear Jesus, in, in all his teaching and in this prayer, is saying the kingdom needs to come on earth like it is in heaven. Your name, Father, needs to be hallowed, and we pray for that. So we're talking about a conflict with an existing kingdom. And, of course... If we miss the rest of the New Testament, we certainly get it in another of the key verses of the entire New Testament. You just got to know this one, uh, Revelation 11:15. Once we get the vision of the ultimate victory, the entire course of heaven and earth and everybody under the earth, they're all saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Okay, that's Revelation eleven fifteen. So you see that we've, we've already seen that this was coming. You can link um, Genesis three fifteen and Revelation eleven fifteen. They both happen to be 15s, the way that they got numbered in the medieval period. Okay, they both link. Okay, what God said to the serpent about a conflict of dynasties and kingdom has come to pass in Jesus. Okay. And it's going to happen. It's going to be consummated. So we got conflicting dynasties. The woman's seed, the serpent, serpent's offspring. The kingdom of light, that's the kingdom of love, versus the kingdom of darkness. Deception, domination, desecration of God's image bearers. And 
the sons and Satan's total M's are totally different. Mission, message, and M.O., okay? Let me tell you about Satan's M.O. and Satan's mission and his meth method. It's to divide and conquer. His thing is to divide and build hostility and divisions and put people against each other. That's what happens to the man and the woman in the garden. You remember this, right? Um, immediately, there's a division. Divide and conquer. Possess and degrade God's image bearers. You need to understand this. When Satan is hoping and leading us to temptation, it's not really about us. We're just the in-between. We bear the image of God, and Satan is against God. And so Satan's agenda is to degrade and desecrate the very image of God in Adam and Eve and in everybody since. You see, that's, that's the big picture of what's going on. When, when you see people who are addicted, when you see people who are confused sexually and chasing after things and finding their identity in things that are an abomination to the way God structured humanity, male and female, when you see people who are so dependent on drugs or so dependent on painkillers or whatever, that, that's, Satan is laughing all the way to you know, what he hopes will be eternity because the image of God in us is degraded, so he's getting at God and proving that God's plan through us is faulty because he's the smart one. Satan is the smart one. He divides. He manipulates. That's his M.O. He thinks he's really smart, and that's the way people who are fallen in the way of Satan work. That's the way most kingdoms of the world work. That's the way most people work. Okay, that's his M.O. That's his mission. That's his M.O. Um, bondage, you know, possession. And he's going to possess us through our possessions. Like Jesus says, you got two kind of loves in this world, the love of money or the love of God. Man, Satan's all into love money, man. And it's the way that he will possess us. And then we're all worried about our money and our possessions, and he's going to possess us through it and bring us down and ultimately get at God. That's the game plan. The son's message, Jesus' message, is totally different. Remember? To destroy the works of the devil and to restore God's purposes for us and to restore all creation. He's, he's here to bring peace, not division and war. And Jesus works through, instead of manipulation and half-truths, and building up hatred among people and stuff like this and grabbing. Jesus works through open heart and open hand, undivided love. And here's the thing. We'll come back to this next week. He's calling you and me into that mission. Because let me go ahead and cut to the chase. We, we should all know this. The way he defeats Satan is undivided love on the cross. It's love. It's not brute force. It's the opposite of brute force. And there are times in your life and my life where God is calling us to turn away from the way everybody else operates in manipulating and even trying to manipulate religious talk about Jesus and to stop being a person who is possessed by our possessions and to stop trying to grab the fruit of the tree so we can know evil for ourselves and make our own decisions and instead be part of the kingdom of undivided love. The scripture says, this is Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Nothing is gonna separate you from my love, God says. Do you believe me? Will you come to me? But you see, if we come to him, he calls us to live in and to live out undivided love. When Jesus sends us in the Great Commission, we just were talking about this earlier today in Sunday school, he does not send us and say, take over all the nations, beat the stew out of them, take over all their palaces, wield the sword, bring them under subjection to me. That's not what he says. He says, go out and witness to my undivided love 
for others. Jesus calls us to a love that is so undivided. We are to love God with all of our, hear, hear this now, Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. The Shema, 6, 4 through 6, 9 of Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Do you hear that? Undivided. Undivided, total all-in love for God. All your soul and all your might or all your strength. And then Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Undivided. You don't divide your neighbor from yourself. It's all in. And Jesus, when he teaches us how to be the church, says, love one another in the same way I have loved you. Undivided. Okay? But then he even says this. We've been here before in this series on Luke, back when we were dealing with the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. Jesus says, love your enemies even with undivided love. Now, that is polar opposite, total radical difference, the difference between hell and heaven, between Satan and the Son. Paul reiterates this in Romans. Paul says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And then Paul sees this incredible vision and promise that he gives us, that Jesus has already given us. Romans 16, verse 20. He says, the God of peace, do you hear that? Not the God of war. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's where the seed singular and the seed plural come together. That's Romans 16, 20, just a, a lightning bolt of this message of God's way and God's promise for us of undivided love. But you see, we've been called to be ministers of love in a world that's full of manipulating and possessing and controlling. We'll come back to this next week, but Jesus says, look, you can't be neutral on this. It's kind of like at the Olympics. You've got to be on one team or the other, right? You're either with me or against me in my way of undivided love, in my way of the cross. So today, and next Sunday too, I want to be inviting you, inviting myself, to come to Jesus. And I do mean come all the way and to go his way. It's going to bring the devil. He's, going to, he's bringing the devil down. I guarantee you that. But the invitation and opportunity is for us to be with him in that mission and in the majesty of his victory. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.